right, well, we're, getting, we're in a series called Relationships, Growing Together in God's Love. And it's all from Ephesians chapter 5. In fact, we've been going through Ephesians for a long, long time. And remember, remember what we talked about. Your identity leads to your destiny. And so when you understand what marriage is and what marriage is not, and you're thinking, oh, I'm not even married. I had no desire to get married. I just got out of a marriage. I'm going to tune out. No, no, don't tune out because this has everything to do with you as well. No matter if you're single, widowed, or divorced, this series, and as in relationships, in the next several weeks, we're dealing with husbands and wives. Then we're going to get into children and parents and your employers and employees. So we're going to deal with all these relationship issues, so I'm really excited about that opportunity. Okay, everybody? Good? Awesome. Let's get right into it. All right, here we go. You guys ready? Yeah. Please don't walk out yet. All the men are like, praise God, I finally came to the right service. Hang on, guys. Wives, submit to your own husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife. Okay, everyone stay in their seat. This is fantastic. What does all that mean? What does it mean to submit? Well, we're going to talk about it in a few moments. Just hang on, everybody. You're going to see something about this verse that is very tricky. You're going to see later on what I'm talking about, all right? <laughs> but this is something that actually in the 1950s, there's actually a book... Yeah, there was actually a book that came out, and here it is. You guys ready to hear about this book? All right. Train your wife in five easy lessons. And so where's Pastor Randy? Is he here? Pastor Randy is going to teach that next semester. All right. Five easy lessons, free booklet here. Te teach her to fetch your newspaper and slippers. <laughs> Massage your feet. Serve you ice cold beer. This is not for me. And snacks, sit quietly while you browse your favorite TV shows, respond to nonverbal cues such as snapping your fingers, <laughs> answer yes, dear, to any and all requests, and much, much more. New scientific method works on most difficult cases. I, this is actually an ad that was out there. Now, something else uh, I was reading... Uh, about this. This is an action article, Good Housekeeping. It was a housekeeping magazine that came out in the 1950s. Now, please understand, everybody, I'm just a reporter. Don't kill the mailman, okay? But this is some of the things that it talked about a wife supposed to do. The men are like, this is fantastic. Okay. Here we go. Ready? This is what you're supposed to do when a man comes home. Have dinner ready. Plan ahead. Even the night before to have delicious meal ready on time for his return. This is a way of letting him know that you have been thinking about him and are concerned about his needs. Most men are hungry when they get home, and the prospect of a good meal is part of the warm welcome needed. Can I hear an amen or no? Okay. okay. Let's go over here. This is a little less stressful. Prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so you'll be refreshed when he arrives. <laughs> Touch up your makeup. Put a ribbon in your hair. And be fresh looking. He has just been with a lot of work and weary people. Be a little happy, but they use a different word than happy. I can't say it because you could be confused. Be a little happy and a little more interesting for him. His boring day may need a lift, and one of your duties is to provide it. Now, this is for the middle section. But ladies, over the cooler months, because we're entering right now, of the year, you should prepare and light a fire for him to unwind by. Your husband will feel as he's reached a haven of rest and order. It will give you a little lift, too. After all, catering to his comfort will provide you with immense personal satisfaction. <laughs> Here's one of my favorites here. Prepare the children. Take a few minutes to wash the children's hands and faces, if they're small, comb their hair, and if necessary, change their clothes. 
They are little treasures, and he would like to see them playing the part. Minimalize all noise. At the time of his arrival, eliminate all noise of the washer, the dryer, or the vacuum. Try to encourage the children to be quiet. This is step for cornerstone. Okay. <laughs> Greet him with a warm smile and show your sincerity in your desire to please him. Here's another one. Go over here. Listen to him. You may have a dozen important things to tell him, but the moment of his arrival is not the time. Let him talk first. Remember, his, his topics of conversation are more important than yours. Uh, this is fantastic. Make, his, make, the, make the evening his. Never complain if he comes home late or goes out to dinner or other places of entertainment without you. Instead, try to understand his world of strain and pressure and, is, and his very real need to be home and relax. Don't complain if he's late for dinner, even if he stays out late or all night. Count this as a minor compared to what you might have gone through throughout the work. And here's two more. Okay, I mean, you guys are ready to throw me off the stage. <laughs> here's another one. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment. Or integrity. <laughs> Remember, he's the master of the house. And as such, will always exercise his will with fairness and truthfulness. You have no right to question him. <laughs> Finally, my personal favorite, a good wife always knows her place. Oh, okay. Now that is obviously horrible. Out of context, this is not what God designed for marriage. But this is something that actually is in a magazine article that was vogue, not vogue, but that was in play in the 1950s. In fact, there was a lot of mistreatment of women. Part of the women's revelation movement is a reaction to men mistreating women. And so there's a kickback from that. It used to be, in the 1950s, I was not alive yet, it used to be, father knows best, right? Remember, the, the father was the best of the house, and Andy Griffith's show, My Three Sons, and, and TV Land has all that. And so this is what it used to be like. But what happened was, as a result, a male superiority and to squash in the woman's spirit, what has happened, there was a kickback. And now we've gone from this in our culture to this. The father is a fool, right? I mean, you look at any sitcom, any sitcom today, I don't watch sitcom, but usually the father is a buffoon. He's an idiot, he's out to lunch, he's immature, even the Bernstein Bears, which I happen to like. The father bear is always an emcompute. The kids know more than the parents, and the wife is smarter than the family, which is probably true, but that's beside the point. But when now we see a, a defamation of masculinity, we see an attack upon masculinity. Because of the abuses of the past, we have gone the opposite extreme. So what are we to do? Act worse and, and actually meet the expectations of what they think? So there is an attack upon being a father and being a husband. So what does the Bible say all about this? Well, let me go back to this verse. Wives submit to your own husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife. Now, this is what you probably hear. But that's actually... Miss, that's actually taken out of context. This verse, like this, is like a soundbite taken out of context. And when you take a soundbite and take God's truth out of context, it becomes an assault upon truth. And so what does the Bible actually say? I'm so glad you asked. Are you ready to go? My wife just almost came up. I slapped my fingers. Oh. <laughs> Joking. Okay, see, see the difference here? Okay. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. We just spent the whole passage of Scripture talking about we are to submit to God and submit to each other, and we should prefer each other. There's a whole passage we'll get into in a few moments. So that's the context of it, okay? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your husbands. Actually, in the Greek, there is no word for submit in verse 22. What it does is it attaches itself to verse 21. Now, it means the same thing. But the translators put, to help you understand it, put submit in here. Okay? Submit to your own husbands. Own husbands, not to submit to every man. Submit to your own husbands 
as to what? That's a big difference. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. It, the, the context of male leadership in the home is a reflection of who Jesus is. That we are men, this is the big, this is the big deal, to be Christ in the home. Now, we're going to talk about the women next week, but this week, because there's about t- uh, two verses for the women and about seven for the guys. So today we're going to talk about the men's role in the marriage. And by the way, this has to do with everyone because this is a reflection or a type of what we are to the body, what Christ is to the church. So spirit-empowered relationships, the role of a husband and Christ and the church. All right, so what we're going to do right now, we're going to read the passage within its context and then we're going to go back and, and, and talk about five, four points, all right? I'm just telling you what's going to happen. So here we go. Please understand that the Bible was written in, uh, in Greek here. And the reason why we have verses and numbers is so we can find things. It was not broken up this way by the Apostle Paul, the, the other authors. We do the best job we can so we can find things. So sometimes what happens, we just take a verse by itself out of context. We have to read the whole thing. And here's the context. The Bible says this, and do not be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life, but be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And so really what we're talking about here, in order for this to work, we need to learn how to be drunk in the Spirit at all times. If you think about an alcoholic or somebody, apparently when you drink, the the buzz wears off. So in in order to keep the buzz going, you got to keep on drinking throughout the day. Do you continually be drunk? And so the Apostle Paul is saying, I want you to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. All through the day, we should be taking swigs of a flask of the Holy Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit come in our lives. This is the context in which this passage is found, that it takes a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered person to do this. And do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, that's what we're doing this morning, singing and making melody in your heart, that the Lord is near. Giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. You see, all this has to do with being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we talked about submitting to each other a couple of weeks ago. I think it's important we go back just for a few moments to go back and talk a little bit about what it means to submit. Because we have to understand relationships. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com and see the past messages. You can go to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and type in Cornerstone Cheshire and you can subscribe and you'll get the sermons to your mailbox so you can listen to it or when you're driving or whatever you're doing just to kind of help you keep on track. Okay, but first of all, what does submission mean? Sub means under mission. That you have to learn to submission. And the military understands this very well. Everyone has the same value but they have different rank and file and purpose. So submission is the key to all relationships. So all relationships originate from God's relationship with himself. And so God didn't create us because he was bored, he needed somebody. He created us because he was in a relationship with himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had a perfect relationship that was born in creativity and generosity, and it was self-sufficient within its own but it continued to grow and create. And so, give me an example here. The Trinity is God, Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Trinity and mutual submission. There's mutual submission within the Trinity. Okay, let me explain a little bit to you. Remember we talked last week, a couple weeks ago, I talked about, I I gave an example about talking to myself, right? That, you know, we're almost like we have a body, we have a mind, we have a spirit. Well, in many ways, God's kind of like that. we got the Father, who's the head, if you will, the controlling and a part of it. You have the Son, you got the Holy Spirit, all one, but they're one God. And they were perfect within themselves. Here's more of a traditional model you might have seen, where you have the Father, you have the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one is not by itself God, but together they are God. They're one entity with three particular responsibilities that work together, just like your body right now. My body's helped me get across here. My, spirit, my, my spirit's inside of me. It brings me life. And my brain is helping me, hopefully, process and make sense. 
If I'm not, blame it on my body, okay? You see that, everybody. So you really can't parse out God. He's all one. So what does that mean? Well, spirit and power relationships. What's the role of the husband and Christ and the church? Are you guys ready? Okay. What we're going to do right now is going to read the passage of Scripture, and then we're going to go back. So bear with me as we read the Bible. Uh, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We believe not only does it contain the Word of God, it is the Word of God. And that is our standard for everything that we do. We believe it's the Word of God. So, and there's good reason for it, which we did a series. You can tr find that online. Here we go. What's the role of the husband in Christ in relationship? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Here we go. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives to be their subject to their, I'm sorry, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, and that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There's a reading of God's word. Now let's get into it. What does that actually mean? What's God's role for man and women? And this week we're going to talk about the men, and next week we're going to talk more about the women. I figure we'll start with the guys first to give the ladies a little break, because you're going to see, men, it's not as wonderful as you think, it's actually better than you ever dreamed or imagined because God's ways work. God's ways work. I like the old Chinese proverb said this, it's harder to lead a family than it is to rule a nation. Boy, that's true. It's easier for me to pastor the church than to pastor my home. Right? That's why the Bible says not many of you become teachers. So it's a big responsibility. And, I, you know, and, and League of Nations, people say this all the time. we got to have more Christians go into politics and run for office. And I agree with you. But even more importantly, we need to have more men and women stand up in the home and lead their families well. Because government comes from the family. You have the family. You have the, you have the extended family. You have the city. You have, you have the town. You have the state, you have the country. It all begins with the husband and the wife, the children, the family, the town, the city, the state. You see how that works? So if we'll take care of our homes, we'll have a lot more authority than if we go out there and blow off our homes and do not be good examples. You see, when you and I have a good home, it gives us pulling power. There's a difference between horsepower and torque in a car. A horsepower can kind of get you there quickly, but torque is the pulling power. And so you may be like a tugboat going very slow, but you can pull a lot. And that's what happens when you and I live it at home. So this is a great opportunity for me to be married. I thank God that I'm married because it helps keep me in line. <laughs> thank God. Okay, so here we go. Husbands, love your wives. Now the word husbands, when you look it up in the Greek and all that, actually, even in the English, you know what it actually means? It actually means this. Husband means one who works the soil, a tiller of the ground, like a farmer. That our job, husbands, guys, 
We're to cultivate our wives and to be gentle and be respectful and loving. Think about how gentle are you when you're planting tomato plants or whatever you're doing. You're tilling the ground. You're making sure there's good ground. You're making sure there's good soil. And you are cultivating her. You are taking, giving her special attention, making sure that she can grow. My objective is not just to keep her submitted and quiet and dumb. No, my job is to help her become the woman of God. You see, you have to understand something. In the culture that the Apostle Paul wrote this, it was a Greek culture. In the Greek culture, women had no rights. They were like property. They were like chattel. They were not treated well at all. In fact, marriage was very loosely uh, taken care of. It's very common for a man to have uh, women on the side. It was okay to do that. As long as you take care of her at home, it didn't make a difference. And that was kind of going on. It was practice to go to the prostitute a couple times a week, and, and go to the temple and go to the prostitute. It's fine. This is what it was taught back in that day. Now, the Jewish community was a lot better than the surrounding uh, communities. In fact, the Bible in the Old Testament brings more grace and more dignity to women than any surrounding culture. But within the Jewish hierarchy and the, the Jewish um, culture of its day, it got to the point where we found some prayers from rabbis saying this, thank you, God, that I'm not a dirty Gentile or a woman. That wasn't in the Bible, but that was a prayer. So women were, they had no rights. They were uneducated. Keep her barefoot and pregnant and ignorant so you can control her. And that was kind of what it was like. Now, there were some good men out there, and there's some great women in the Bible. You can see tremendous, powerful women in the Bible that God used throughout the Old Testament. And now you move to the New Testament, the greatest women liberator that ever was was not Gloria Steinem. It's Jesus Christ. It's quite significant, for example, that the very first evangelist in the Bible that spread the gospel was a woman in John chapter 4, the woman at the well. The first person to see Jesus when he rose again from the dead, which is really important. The first eyewitness was a woman, not a man. Why is that? Now, one of the reasons I believe that Christianity is true, many reasons, because if you're going to fabricate a false religion, why would the first witness of evidence be someone that society had no, there was no currency in the woman at all. Her, her, her witness had no place in a court of law, yet the Bible is the first witness as a woman. You can see women throughout Jesus' ministry. You can see women in the upper room. Later on, you have Priscilla and Aquila. First it says Priscilla and Aquila, then it says Aquila and Priscilla. So you can see that they were working together. So the Bible gives more Grace, more power, more strength, and more dignity to women than any surrounding culture of his day. And Jesus is the greatest woman liberator that ever was or ever shall be. We make that very, very clear. Okay, so back to this. Husbands. The actual word means tiller, take care, cultivate. Almost like John 15 when Jesus talks about, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So the spirit-empowered role of husband is initiators who cultivate. You are to go first. You are to be the first one to serve. Now, there's something very interesting here that I wanted to also talk to you about for a few moments. Is in that initiation of cultivation, please understand me, that God, everything God does is for purpose and reason. There is a physical, physiological design of men and women as well. Okay? And in many ways, you can see, even in that how we're made, our bodies are designed, men are the initiators, women are the receivers, just from our anatomy alone. You can see the function of men and, and men and women, and you can even see how it even shows itself within the created order and biologically and anatomically. It's how it works together, that they become one flesh, that they work together. A husband and wife are not two. They're two that become one. And the moment you fight against yourself is the moment you're in trouble. It's almost like tying your leg together and trying to walk, and, and this person's going this way. The only way you can walk together is you have to agree. And that's why it takes a husband and wife to work together as one. So men aren't supposed to be the initiators, and guys, don't wait for the woman to get it right. You are the initiator. You're the one that's supposed to first ask for forgiveness. You're the one to first go to one sheet. No, we go first, guys. Why? Because that's what we're called to do. 
Someone's got to take responsibility. It's a woman's responsibility as well, but someone has to take the initiation. The initiation of being a servant is so important in the scriptures. So let's go ahead and continue to look at what the Bible says. So husbands, then we get the word love, which is actually agape. It's in the imperative case, and the Greek sentence is continually husbands love. Agape. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, I love my wife. I told her that when we first got married. I don't have to tell her again. If anything changes, so I'll let her know. Um, I was, uh, I was reading this about some children that uh, asked what love is. And sometimes uh, children are the funniest in the world. They look great. And, and here's some quotes when they ask, what is love? Here's some kids said about love. You guys ready what love means according to these kids? Okay. Here's one kid said this, a seven-year-old. Love is when a girl wears perfume and the boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> Another child said, love is all the things written in Valentine's cards, and then he qualified. It's, you know, all the things you like to say to someone, but you never be caught dead saying it. <laughs> Here's another one, quite extraordinary. This one's significant. Another child said, love was when my grandmother got arthritis, and she couldn't bend over to paint her toenails anymore. So my grandpa did it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. Isn't that beautiful? Come on, one more time, everybody. Aww. Husbands, love your wives. I, I take a bullet for my wife. Yeah, most guys would take a bullet for the wife. Most guys would run in front of a speeding train for their wife to get rid of them. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> Most guys would do that. But it's a lot different every day dying. Listen, I wish I could say I was better at this than I am. I, 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 I'll be honest, if it, with, to be honest with you, to be transparent with you, my wife's a whole lot better uh, at treating me well than me treating her. And it's really it's upsetting to me that I can't outgive her and outbless her. I try, but she always outdoes me. But husbands, love your wives. Now, here's the, here's the thing. You guys ready? Here's the impossible part. Love the wives as what? Christ. Husband loves your wives as? Christ. Oh, boy. Yeah. So this is something you'll never reach the pinnacle of. We are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. We're supposed to be Jesus. And guess what Jesus did? Jesus left the man cave of heaven and came down to where we are. He lowered himself to serve us. Uh, Jesus became a slave to the church. Jesus, uh, by the very end of his life, went to his disciples, took off his outer garments at a dinner, put a towel around his waist, bent down before his disciples, and washed their feet. That was the job of a slave. That was scandalous. Do you see that, everybody? He was not there to get his. She needs to serve me. She needs to do this. She needs to do this and the other. She's my little trophy wife. I go around. I'll keep her looking nice. And so, but no, no. He came to serve the church. He came to sacrifice his wants and his desires. And when I hear that and see that, I'm like, I have a long way to go. Maybe I'm the only one here today. Husband, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave of himself. Philippians chapter 2 is the most profound passage in the Bible when it comes to what it means to be like Jesus. Although he was God, he left it all behind to serve, left his comfort. That's what he did. So, initiators who cultivate. Here's another one. The command to love as Jesus loved. The command to love as Jesus loved. C.S. Lewis said this, A husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church, ready to lay down his life for her. This is the highest kind of love and 
the hardest kind of love, laying down your rights, sometimes being quiet, sometimes accepting being wronged, doesn't mean that we become passive wimps. Okay, dear, go ahead, dear. Go ahead, dear. No, 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 no. We're not talking about that. We're talking about loving our wives, and even sometimes when it's difficult. You see, but God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he didn't wait for us to get our act together. When she will, then I will. I'm not going to be treated that way anymore. Tough. I'm not talk- I'm going to give her ice, baby, ice. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Ice, baby, ice, baby. I'm going to give her ice. I'm, gonna- I'm not going to talk to her for a week. Uh, I'm gonna- no. That's not what we're called to do. We're supposed to be like Jesus. While we were still sinners, Christ came for us. He didn't say, get your act together then. He says, I'm going to come when you're a complete disaster. Men, we are to go after our wives even when they blow it, even when they make mistakes, even when they're way wrong. You and I, uh uh-oh, you and I need... Is Sandra back there? Oh, no, she's right here. For those of you watching online, they just put the timer up there. Okay. I'm an hour and 30 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. So we are to go after first. You see that, everybody? First. Be the initiator. That's our job. That's what we're created to be. So initiators who cultivate the command to love as Jesus. And here is another one as we go forward. For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Jesus is the head of the church. Husbands, we should be the leader of the home, but we're not to be a leader to, to, to make the woman submissive to our wills and wishes. We are to serve her as Christ served the church and gave his life for her. It's not about me. It's about seeing her to become the woman of God he's called her to be. So the commander as Jesus to be the, le- the head leader or the head servant. He who wants to be the greatest in the kingdom of God must first be the servant of all. You see, the servanthood in the New Testament is not walk, oh, I'm the pastor of the church and they need to serve me. You know, be my armor bearer. I mean, there was a situation I heard about a pastor. Unfortunately, I'm not going to mention this guy's name, but he would get off the stage and go like this. They'd take off his jacket. They'd give him a new jacket. they put slippers on his feet. Oh, the bishop this, the bishop that, the bishop this. He's all a man. No, no, no. My job is to be a servant. Right? And that's the job. So be the head leader servant. I like what Tim Keller said. God bless him. He's with the Lord now. He said this. I'm so grateful for great men and women of God that have gone on and uh, you know what? They thank God for wisdom passed through the ages. But this is what he had to say, which is really true. A husband's love for his wife should be characterized by what? Selflessness, humility, and a commitment to her spiritual growth and her well-being. I want to see Sandra become the beautiful woman she is. I want to help the process through, not inhibit it. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. Should we take care of your own body, right? That's, listen, not to love your wife is to hurt yourself. There is a process that has to happen. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but what? Nurses and cherishes it just as the Lord did the church. So a wife has difficulty submitting to her husband is because she doesn't feel secure in his love. I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know if he's got some other woman on the side. Uh, he doesn't let me have access to his phone. I don't know. I caught something on the internet the other day. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what's going on with him. She doesn't want to submit to that. Just like you, you want to go on a boat and try to sleep when you know there's a leak? Of course not. So one of the ways we do that, guys, is we need to provide a place, a safe haven, and to be real with our wives. Don't have secrets, which is for next week. Okay, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So guys, we're supposed to wash our wives by the word. Our words can be blessings to her. Sandra was just telling me last night, and, you know, and I, I just, it was kind of a, a beautiful nudge. 
She goes, I love when you pray with me. You don't pray as much as you used to. Oh, oh, you don't buy me flowers. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, that's, that's what we're called to do. When you pray, couples that pray together, stay together. So, but, but I'm single. Now, this has to do with you as well, because it's Christ and the church as well. See, washing the water by the word, that he might present her to himself, glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I mean, I know some guys that buy cars, sports cars, collectible cars. Man, what do they do? They put the, they put the wax on it. They color match it. They put chrome on the thing. And they, I mean, the thing is beautiful, right? And they even like, they don't even drive the car. They just, just take good care of it. And they care more about their car than their own family. Now, I don't know anyone like that in this church, of course. But let me help. But that's how we're, guys, that's how we're supposed to take care of our wife. I'm going to put a new manifold on her. No, 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 no. <laughs> Doesn't mean you have to go to the office of it, no. What it simply means, we need to cherish our wives and do a good job. I, listen, guys, I stand up here not even close to being like Jesus like I need to be. There's so much I need to grow in this myself, okay? I'm a pretty selfish person by nature. I have to fight against selfishness. Selfish, selfishness. I'm so selfish I can't even say the word. I don't want to give it up. That he might present her to himself a glorious church or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So we have that. Initiators who cultivate the command to love as Jesus, to be the head of the lead, to be the head leader, servant, and to lead spiritually and to cherish. To cherish and to lead spiritually. You know, I heard something that you cannot substitute, my friends, is time. I heard a story of a man that loved this woman, and he was, they weren't married, but he kept writing her letters. First, it was once a day. Then it was twice a day. Then it was three times a day. He would send her letters. He wrote, he wrote over 120 letters to this woman. You know what happened? She married the mailman. Guys, we can't mail it in. We can't mail it in. There's no substitute for proximity. There's no substitute for face-to-face -face communication. There's no substitute for spending time. You can say all the words you want to. You can write all the text messages you want to. You can send her gifts. But there's nothing like proximity. There's nothing as spending time. Any relationship without spending proximity and time will die. And so don't just mail it in, guys. We need to pursue our wives. And the truth of the matter is, the more you pursue your wife, the more you will love your wife because you're designed to do such. And, you know, I love my parents. have been married 60, uh, 61 or 62 years now. They honestly say we love each other now more than we ever had before. We have more passion in our marriage as well. They love each other, and it's beautiful. They'll have more love now than they did before. My friends, that's what God has called us to become like. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for the incredible model you've given us. Lord, you made all relationships. And Father, I thank you so much for the gift of marriage. I thank you, Father God, that you have told, given us as men an incredible role to love our wives as Christ loves the church. Lord, I pray for those today that have gone through a divorce that are single, Perhaps those that have not married yet, and maybe some are not going to be called to marry. But Father, I pray right now that we would take the mantle as men, that we'd encourage guys we see that are married. Father, that we would help steer each other to be the leaders of the home and the saviors of the home that you've called us to become. Lord, I pray that we'd help our friends to, just to encourage them to lay down their lives for their wives. And Father, I pray myself included today, Lord, that I want to be a whole lot better than I am Lord, that I, would lead, that I would serve, and my friends and my guy friends here today, Lord, all of us together, we do that. Lord, I pray you bless our marriages. Father, I pray you bring healing upon our marriages in this place. Yes. Father, you're the restorer of all things, and we speak blessing. We speak for restored marriages. We, we speak a year from now, we're going to have testimonies of people whose marriages were saved and now are helping other people in Jesus' name.